Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm very grateful to Ms. Gatonic for hosting me for this event, and to Jacqueline Castell, who assisted me tremendously, more than words can say, with the audiovisual presentation. I was telling a friend outside that if I were left to my own devices, I'd be holding up a book with a flashlight, and that would be the extent <laughs> of my, my tech presentation. But what you'll see is really very special. Um, I'm further grateful uh, to Ms. Katonic for hosting me on this particular subject. It is not easy uh, to speak about uh, the topic of Satanism, uh, whether I'm speaking from a, a spiritual and ethical perspective, or as I'm speaking tonight, from a cultural and literary perspective. It is obviously, by its very nature, a tremendously provocative and hot button topic. And for those of you who know me and who have heard me speak before or who have had contact with me, I think you probably know that I'm not interested in provocation as an end to itself in any way. I don't rubberneck at car accidents. I don't think tragedy is entertaining and I'm not interested in shock value. All I'm interested in, and the only thing that sets the discourse for what I present, what I write about, what I speak about, is plumbing the depths of my own search. That's something that I wish for everyone in this room and for everyone watching this. There is nothing I can do to avert or sidestep or provide some sort of an exit ramp off of my own search into any place that attracts me, whether it's a place that's popular, whether it's a place that resonates with large portions of the public, or whether it's a place that's considered somehow uh, forbidden or off limits, hence the title of tonight's presentation, God of the Outsiders. Although what I'm presenting tonight is in many regards a cultural presentation, uh, like everything I do. It reflects my own search and my own deepest interests, which I hope you'll see reflected in what we explore tonight. And what we're really going to explore tonight is this counter tradition of the Satanic, the Luciferian, that has been existent in the Western world, in other parts of the world, going back to some of our earliest recorded literature and works of art and culture. We have, of course, a, an off-the-shelf definition of what the satanic, who Satan is supposed to be, what Satanism is supposed to be. We have an off-the-shelf definition here in the West, which dictates that it's some sort of evil adversarial force or figure that wishes humanity no good. And I have an entirely different point of view, which is not one that's just self-generated or self-created, but which is one, as I hope to show, from uh, tonight's demonstration, which is one that has a thread of history that extends back to some of our earliest expressions in the Western world, in the Eastern world, and in different cultures. It's not just a nice idea that there is this concept of the satanic or of the Luciferian that is rebellious, that is romantic, that is affirming of the individual, that is affirming of the outsider, that is affirming of emancipation, liberation, self-expression. That's not just a platform that I came up with yesterday to suit my own interests and upon which I decided to hang the term Satanism, but in fact, it's a real counter tradition, an esoteric tradition in the truest sense that has existed in the form of some of our earliest artistic, literary, ethical, spiritual and cultural traditions. And so we begin, and so we begin. My first discovery of the satanic probably came during the period of my upbringing in Eastern Queens, where I received an Orthodox bar mitzvah in what was a fairly traditional uh, Jewish community in the towns of Belrose and New Hyde Park. And I remember very vividly on Yom Kippur, the rabbi or some dignitary at our little local synagogue, which wasn't much bigger than this room, would read from Leviticus 16, which was about a period of time when the Hebrews were wandering during their 40 years in the desert, and they would cast their sins once a year at the time of year that's not far from 
from this very date now that we call Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, they would cast their sins on a goat and they would let this goat loose into the desert to be devoured by a demonic figure who was believed to live in the desert named Azazel. And a chill always went through me when I heard the rabbi or the cantor chanting from the bima at the front of the synagogue. And he would come to the term Azazel. And it was so exciting to me because this wasn't something that Mrs. Shapiro taught us about in Sunday school. And I wanted to know more. Who was this demonic figure who lived in the desert, who was memorialized in Leviticus 16, who the Hebrews took so seriously as a real, actual, physical being that once a year they would make the sacrifice of a goat to this being. There's so much supernaturalism in scripture which kids rarely really get taught about. I mean, you have witches and giants and fallen angels and servants of God and so-called demonic beings and all kinds of things going on that are just so extraordinary because they really represented vested real empirical beliefs that our primordial ancestors held. And this name Azazel always stuck with me and he appeared again in Paradise Lost where he serves as Satan's standard bearer about which we'll be talking more. Every culture has different conceptions of opposing or adversarial forces, forces of destruction and creation. Within Vedic culture, you have Shiva, who is often referred to as the goddess of destruction, the divine dancer, who destroys what is so that the new can grow. In the sense, Shiva is really the goddess of the time of year that we're entering right now, the fall, the autumn, where things get cold, things wither on the ground only so that they can be reborn. This is also true of the god goddess Kali, who you see brandishing a sword and the head of a wrongdoer here. Kali, too, is a goddess of creative destruction, divine destruction. And there are people within Hinduism who hold to the belief, and I would take this very, very seriously, that if you pray to Kali, you will get what you want, but you will also unleash chaos you will unleash a kind of divine chaos. And that's long been a tradition associated with some of these adversarial figures, or what we in the West came to call satanic figures. The idea being that if you pray to this deity, you'll get what you want. You'll get what you want, but you'll get a great deal of chaos as well. In the Nordic tradition, of course, there's the figure of Loki, who has recently been popularized, or at least since 2011, in all the Marvel movies where he's this stunningly handsome, likable, funny anti-hero. But Loki, to the primordial Nordic peoples, was in many ways a god of mischief, a god of troublemaking, and the, one of the oldest myths around Loki, and one of the reasons why to this day we consider the number 13 a number of bad luck is that Loki was invited to a banquet of the gods, and he was a 13th guest at the banquet of the gods, which ended in argument and violence. Judas Iscariot is seen as the 13th man at the Last Supper. And within Vedic culture too, to this day, it is considered unlucky to have 13 guests at a banquet. No one can quite place their finger on the historical antecedent for the number 13, becoming associated with bad luck. There's all kinds of, of historical antecedents. It's the day that the Knights Templar was suppressed, and there are many other such references in history. But I'm always intrigued when a certain belief seems to cross cultural and geographical boundaries, and that's been true of the number 13. Another adversarial figure who appeared in Hellenic culture is Prometheus, Prometheus, who was said to steal fire from the gods and bring it down to humanity, thus completing humanity's development and capacity to cook food, to forge metal, to clear forests, to really live and exist as sentient beings. And Zeus, or Jupiter, was so furious with Prometheus for committing the crime of bringing fire to humanity that he imprisoned him for all eternity 
on a mountainside where an eagle would come each day, eat out his liver, the liver would grow back at night, and then the next day, chained Prometheus would have to endure the agony of the eagle eating out his liver again until Prometheus was freed by Hercules. Now, you will find images of Prometheus everywhere throughout our city. We happen to be in New York City tonight. This image is from the ceiling of the, the beautiful domed uh, rotunda in the New York Public Library on 42nd Street. You'll find a magnificent gold statue of Prometheus at Rockefeller Center. The idea being that this was the figure who finally brought us out of the caves. Another figure from antiquity was the horned god Pan. The horned god Pan, half goat, half man. And Pan was associated with wine and music and sexuality and the Bacchanal. You'll begin to develop an understanding of why horned beings came to be associated with the satanic. Although again, there's this tantalizing cross-cultural quality to all this. Just as I was describing the number 13 appearing in widely dispersed cultures, the Hebrews are casting their sins upon a horned goat, which came later to be called the scapegoat. The Greeks are investing all their qualities of lust and music and libertine behavior and sexuality on a horned god, Pan, Pan. And here is another figure from ancient Egypt, Set, the god Set. I took that picture myself. It's very, very hard to make out, I know. I took that at the Egyptian Museum earlier this year when I was in Egypt with my friend Ronnie Thomas, who's here tonight, who's a film director, and I'll be saying a little bit more about that. But Set is sometimes seen as a Satan archetype within the Egyptian pantheon of gods. And no one can quite say what Set is. Scholars and historians will refer to the Set animal, the Set animal, because the protrusions from the top of his head, and he generally is depicted as a man, they're not quite horns, they're not quite ears. His snout sort of has the appearance of a jackal. His body is that of a man. So no one can quite say what Set is, but again, there are these beautiful horn-like structures emerging from the top of his head. It's easy to understand why the Hebrews and the Egyptians would have something in common, because they lived in the same neighborhood, so to speak. But the Greeks didn't have much cultural contact with that world going back to deep antiquity. So it's very intriguing. Another figure who constantly appears as a force of change, a force of creative destruction, a force of usurpation throughout all kinds of primeval cultures is, of course, the serpent or the snake. And this is a, a Renaissance era depiction of the snake in the garden, supposedly tempting Eve. Now, I make a very different reading of Genesis 3 than the traditional one, and I think it can be supported. If you look at Genesis 3 very carefully, you'll see the possibility of a story that's different from the traditional understanding. The traditional understanding is that the devil, so to speak, in the form of the serpent, tempts Eve to eat this apple from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She obeys the serpent, seduces Adam into also biting from the apple, and suddenly they're no longer these beatified, beloved, childlike beings living in paradise but they're grown, mature men and women who have defied the word of God. And God expels them from the garden, and they're forced to dwell east of Eden. And this is said to be the fall of humanity. But look at it from another perspective. Look at it from another perspective. Now, Genesis 3 actually makes reference to two trees. One is the familiar tree of knowledge of good and evil. The other is the tree of life. And some scholars have theorized that they're both the same tree. And here you have this God, this creator, Yahweh, Jehovah, who places humanity into an untenable position. They are told, Adam and Eve are told, in effect, yes, you can live here in the garden, and you'll be fed, you won't need clothes, you'll be taken care of, you'll have the run of the place, but there's one thing you can't do, taste of knowledge taste of knowledge. 
Doesn't that sound a great deal like the attitude of Jupiter or Zeus when he grew so furious with Prometheus? Why should humanity have fire? Fire allows you to forge tools, art, weapons. It's another interesting question. Now, in Genesis 3, the snake doesn't lie to Eve. He says to Eve, you've been told that if you eat from this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. You will not die. And she bites of the fruit, and she does not die. And when she approaches Adam, she doesn't seduce Adam. That's sort of a, a myth of feminine nature. He very willingly eats of the fruit. And yes, they are expelled from the garden. And yes, they do have to labor. And yes, Eve does experience pain in childbirth, gives birth to two sons, Cain and Abel. And Cain, as we know, commits an act of fratricide. But, but, it could be that friction is the price that we pay for sentient awareness. Could be that friction is the price that humanity pays for creativity. Again, Prometheus brought fire. You can use fire to forge a sword, or you can use fire to forge a plowshare or a beautiful headdress. Fire is choice. The apple from the tree is choice. This is a beautiful depiction of the Ouroboros, the snake eating its tail, which symbolizes unity, life, renewal, <coughs> eternal recurrence. Again, from the Hellenic world, this is actually a beautiful Art Deco rendition of the Ouroboros from the doorway of the Theosophical Society in Reykjavik, Iceland, where I visited maybe about 16 months ago, and I took that picture myself. I was struck with its absolute beauty. But it's an example of how the snake shows up again and again in all different cultures, Vedic, Hellenic, Egyptian, and Hebraic, as being a usurper, a revolutionary. When you meet the snake, nothing is ever the same again. And you could see how humanity, as, as we exist today, began to shape some of its perceptions and counter-perceptions of this adversarial force. You see it in the book of Revelation. This is an illustration of a French illuminated Bible, hand-designed, hand-printed, from very late antiquity which demonstrates one of the beasts, one of the multi-headed beasts of Revelation, and the dragon, and the dragon. If you look alongside the perimeter, closer to me, you'll see the dragon from Revelation, which came to be associated with Satan. It's very important to realize, as I'm sure many of you in this room know, that when the term Satan appears in Scripture, it means, it, its Hebrew definition is some sort of adversary or opposing force. It's very open to interpretation. It's only been over the course of many, many centuries that we, as a Western culture, came to define the satanic as the devil, the guy with the tail, the pitchfork, the horns, who tempts you, who's evil. A dragon is what appears in Revelation. A dragon causes a great ruckus and fight and friction in heaven and is thrown from heaven and temporarily has control over earth until he experiences final vanquishment. A dragon blesses this beast, this multi-headed beast, who serves temporarily as kind of lord and master over the earth. So again, you see a serpent committing an act of usurpation. And this dragon being expunged from heaven is a large part of where the idea comes from that Satan was defeated and kicked out of heaven, that Satan was this rebellious angel who wanted to run things his way, or at least not bow to a god who denied knowledge to men and women in their earliest inception. And he suffered for it. He was expelled, again, not from a garden, but from the heavens, and served within this place called hell, which we'll later come back to. Here's another example of a serpent in the Bible. This is the figure of Leviathan, who appears several times in the Old Testament in Job, in Isaiah, in Psalms. Leviathan is, again, this serpent who opposes the status quo and has become associated with the satanic. And here you see, in this illuminated manuscript from the medieval period, 
the so-called Antichrist spoken of in Revelation on the back of Leviathan. Another aspect of scripture that's come into the Western mind is this idea of fallen angels, fallen angels. In Genesis and in the apocryphal book of Enoch, we're told that there were these angels called watchers who came to earth to consort and mate with beautiful women on the earthly plane. And they gave birth to offspring called the Nephilim, the Nephilim, who were giants and who terrorized the earth. You'll find references to giants at several points in Hebrew scripture. You'll find references to these giants in a, a fuller, more explicit way in the apocryphal book of Enoch. So the idea was that these watchers, these so-called fallen angels, came to earth, mated with women, gave birth to a race of giants, and it may have required the great flood recorded in Noah to wipe out this race of giants. But you see how these threads start to converge. Fallen angels, snakes, serpents, the expulsion from the garden, the expulsion from heaven, this idea that there's this paradise-like state that somehow was opposed and that that the forces of opposition which came to be called satanic demonic and so forth the forces of opposition represent everything according to the traditional telling that is negative violent bad tempting but again there's another telling there's another telling there's a telling that reflects a kind of legitimate rebellion against an authority who didn't want humanity to emerge from the cave, who didn't want the apple of truth to be bitten into, who didn't want fire with its potential for creativity and destruction to be possessed by humanity. There also appears in scripture a tremendous ambiguity about the dichotomy between God and the so-called devil as this opposing force came to be known. And you see that in the book of Job. We're told in the book of Job that the so-called satanic figure makes a wager with God that one of his most pious acolytes, the rich, virtuous, plentiful man known as Job, could be tormented and tempted to renounce God. And Jehovah in the book of Job, I think rather cruelly, agrees to this bet. And Job is put through torment after torment after torment, and he retains his faith, but the book leaves humanity with this existential riddle of why? What was this all for? Was there any purpose? And when Job complains to God and said, why, why did you put me through all this torment? Why was I the butt of this cosmic gamble between you and Satan? and demands of God an explanation. And God responds to him only, were you there when I created the earth? Were you there when I created the heavens? In other words, what right have you to ask me to justify my actions? I personally find that a profoundly dissatisfying exchange. <laughs> You're beginning to detect my sympathies, aren't you? We all have them. Um, <laughs> it's very reassuring to hear you laughing because with this light shining in my face, I can't see any one of you. So, <laughs> you know, oral feedback is literally the only thing that tells me whether you're grooving to any of this. Um, and finally, I've spoken of Satan, but I haven't spoken of Lucifer, the figure of Lucifer. This is one of the most controversial terms to emerge from scripture because again, there isn't any devil-like figure called Lucifer who appears in Scripture. What appears in the book of Isaiah is a reference to Venus as the morning star, and the morning star, once so proud, once so resplendent, is brought low. So Lucifer, the light bearer, is a rough, vulgar Latin translation of the Aramaic term for morning star, and as that term is used in the book of Isaiah, it's believed to refer to the king of Babylon within, with whom the Hebrews were, were locked in battle at the time the book of Isaiah or the prophecy of Isaiah was written. So this idea of 
Lucifer or light bearer, this morning star, being laid low, being brought down to dust, was a metaphor for the Hebrews defeating the king of Babylon. But this too, as centuries passed and as all these different strands began to get gathered together into one bunch, so to speak, this too became associated with the idea of a fallen rebel, a fallen being, a fallen angel called Satan or called Lucifer. Now, some of my friends uh, within the world of esoteric studies, and this was true of Rudolf, the great teacher Rudolf Steiner as well, and many seekers who I deeply respect today, it's important to them to make a distinction between Satan and Lucifer. I personally do not make that distinction. I understand that distinction. Some would say that Satan is the force of violence and evil, and Lucifer is the force of usurpation, rebellion, self-affirmation. I don't really make that distinction because I think that both of those um, aspects of the human story, human parable, human myth, and I use that term myth in the highest sense, both those aspects refer to the same uh, phenomenon basically in scripture. And scripture is a patchwork of parables, myths, ethical teachings, ideas that was sewed together across centuries by many, many different people, similar to the Vedas, coming out of the Hindu tradition, similar to the, the great stories and the psychological parables of the gods coming out of Greek, Roman, Persian tradition. Now, all of these concepts of a fallen being were in the mind of late ancient humanity, part of one whole. And there are reasons why people will make a distinction between a Satan and a Lucifer, but I almost think that's looking for, and I, I, again, I say this personally and subjectively, I almost think it's looking for an exit ramp to avoid talking about a topic that's profoundly difficult. And I, I don't make any such distinction. I think they are branches from the same tree. The concept of hell also began to occupy uh, the Western mind, especially in late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And some of these concepts, as I was alluding with Satan and Lucifer, they're referred to very metaphorically and indirectly in scripture. The Hebrews spoke of Sheol, which was a place that all the dead went, um, similar to the place called Hades in the Hellenic tradition. Uh, the New Testament began to speak more in terms of a paradise versus a Sheol as a place of hell. So people began to think of hell or an underworld in more concrete physical empirical terms uh, with the rise and, and advent of Christianity and with the eventual uh, popularization of New Testament scripture in the form of Latin. And it was Dante's Inferno uh, in the early Renaissance that helped, I think, demarcate hell as an actual physical concrete place in the Western mind. Dante served as a kind of magnetic north to distill all of humanity's ideas about hell. And he spoke of hell as being a place composed of nine circles. Um, the first circle was what we would call limbo or purgatory, where you went if you, you know, weren't so bad, um, but didn't quite you know, qualify yet to have your ticket punched into heaven. And the ninth circle was the place where Satan himself dwelt, and that was where the worst of the worst went. Now, I don't believe in this conception of hell. I think this conception of hell is a legalistic idea that was developed by a culture that needed to stratify itself and kind of create a hierarchy of who's acceptable and who's not acceptable. But I would note, uh, especially to those who may be watching on video, that if you do hold to a traditional conception of hell and you take seriously what Dante was talking about, it might interest you to know that the ninth circle, the place where the worst of the worst went, was a place reserved for those who committed acts of treachery, acts of treachery. And part of my code, which I hope I abide by, especially since I'm speaking of it publicly, is that I believe it's extremely important to abstain from gossip and disloyalty. I believe solidarity is extremely important, something I'll speak about later. And people who have traditional conceptions of hell uh, ought to keep in mind that he who shaped 
the concept of hell most fully in the Western mind believed that the treacherous were those who were bound for the worst part of it. Um, finally, I was referring to the idea of a hierarchy within Western culture. Who's in, who's out? Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Well, the use of horns in art and literature became very uh, confusing in the Western mind, especially with the unveiling of Michelangelo's great statue of Moses, in which he depicts Moses with a pair of horns protruding from his head. Michelangelo wasn't making any kind of primeval anti-Semitic statement or anything like that. He was working off of a Latin translation of scripture that described Moses descending from Mount Sinai after having received the Ten Commandments from God with his face covered with horns of light, horns of light. It would have been better translated as rays of light, rays of light, but it became a folk belief that uh, Jewish people had horns to the extent where I had a, a playwright, a playwriting teacher in high school. I went to the Long Island High School of the Performing Arts. I had a playwriting teacher who was a Jewish a refugee from the Holocaust uh, during World War II, and she and a small group of her friends were being led through an English town that was giving them uh, safe refuge uh, during the Second World War. And she said there was a woman who leaned out of her window while these young girls were being walked through this town uh, where they were being given uh, refuge, and in a very thick Cockney accent, the woman said, uh, those are Jews, I thought Jews had horns. So this belief was still active well into the 20th century and um, I don't think it was something Michelangelo ever intended as a mark of, of hatred, it was just uh, a, a, a mistranslation of scripture and it fed into a mythos of the Jew as Christ killer and so you had this notion that the, the Jew had horns, the mark of of the devil, of the opposer, of the adversary. Um, this, this little amulet, this pendant that you see there was one that my mother gave to me. It was a family heirloom, it's from the early 20th century, uh, which depicts Moses in a more accurate light according to scripture. You'll see rather than horns, he has rays of light coming out of his head. Now, in the Middle Ages, in the Renaissance, uh, popular literature and things that were really intended as entertainment uh, came to do a great deal to shape our conception of this opposing force, to shape our conception of Satan and the Satanic. And one of the most uh, popular uh, forms of cultural expression that shaped the public's outlook on the Satanic was Christopher Marlowe's play Dr. Faustus, in which the figure of Dr. Faustus famously makes a pact with the devil and he makes this deal that in exchange for worldly pleasures and omniscient knowledge, he will give the devil his soul. And here in this late 60s production of Marlowe's Faust at the British National Theater, uh, you see the sorry results of Faust's pact with the devil. But it's important to understand and that there have been many different iterations of the Faust legend. Faust is almost certainly thought to have been a real person. There have been many historical arguments over his identity, but more or less he was probably some kind of a radical a theologian and an alchemist who lived in Central Europe in the first half of the 1500s, and he was rumored to have sold his soul to the devil, so to speak. He made a pact with the devil, a topic that we'll come back to, a topic that some people feel had antecedent in scripture. And so Marlowe, it's very important to understand this, Marlowe uh, wrote Faust, first of all, it was towards the end of his own life. He died at the very young age of 29 in 1593. When Marlowe wrote Faust, there were the beginnings of a backlash against some of the occult experimentation that had gone on during the Renaissance, particularly in the German-speaking area of Central Europe, uh, between the Rhine Valley in the west and Prague and Bohemia in the east. That area, that German-speaking area, was a hotbed of occult experimentation. People were interested in alchemy and astrology and different forms of divination, reincarnation, number symbolism, 
all things that were considered verboten by the church, but which were being rediscovered by Renaissance scholars and translators who were beginning to translate ancient manuscripts that were coming out of Greece, Rome, Egypt, Persia. And suddenly, there was a, a vogue among educated classes in teachings that came to be called occult, occult being a Latin term for hidden. And the Renaissance mind was very aroused and excited by this idea that there was this primeval, this primeval spirituality that was older than Christianity, that was older than Judaism, that was older than anything the world knew. And this was probably the kind of thinking that inspired the real figure known as Faust. And his virtuosity in folklore was attributed to making some sort of a pact with darkness. Marlowe, in his play Faust, really fed into that. There was a, there was a somewhat polemical quality to the play. But there was another iteration of the Faust myth, and that was written by Goethe many, many years later in 1832. And the truth is, most of us who are familiar with the Faust myth are probably somewhat familiar with it coming out of the work of Goethe, which is widely considered to be the greater of the two works. It's more psychologically textured. And you can begin to see that in this illustration by the, the, the artist uh, August von Krelling, uh, which is, admittedly is from quite late in 1877. But there was this idea of Mephistopheles or Mephisto, the German term for Satan, uh, befriending a Faust who was in some ways his, his, his equal. He was clever, he was tough-minded. And Mephistopheles and Faust struck a very, very interesting bargain. It was different from what was expressed in Marlowe, where it was a simple kind of pact that in exchange for goodies, I'll give you my soul. Rather, in Goethe's Faust, in Goethe's Faust, the figure of Faust is somewhat the devil's equal intellectually, and he doesn't trust Mephistopheles to keep his word. And Mephistopheles says to him, look, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you everything that you want, sexually, intellectually, materially, and the deal is that if I deliver to you so much happiness that you experience a moment in which you would want to dwell forever, only then will you die. It's an unusual sort of bargain. It's an unusual sort of bargain. Only then will you die. When you're so happy that you're experiencing a moment that you would like to endure for all eternity, then I get your soul and you have to serve me in hell. And at the end of the play, because the bargain never really quite gets, gets fulfilled, uh, Faust doesn't have to go to hell. Faust sort of outsmarts the devil in a certain way. This is an Art Deco illustration of Goethe's Faust that I very much like from the artist Harry Clark. And you see a very different version of the tormented figure that we were looking on uh, in the stage production of Marlowe. You see a sort of clever figure who is under discipleship to a, an equally clever a Mephistopheles. The apprentice and the master are somewhat equal in Goethe's Faust story. Now, <clears throat> there began to develop, growing out of Milton's interpretation of, of Satan in Paradise Lost, uh, a kind of artwork that could be called heroic Satanism. There was a, a, a depiction of Satan as a brooding, rebellious, perhaps justly disgruntled rebel who, if nothing else, demonstrated a hugely admirable defiance in the face of this all-commanding power known as God. Uh, this illustration by uh, artist Richard Westhall is a very good depiction of the so-called heroic Satan. This is called Satan and Beelzebub. Satan is the figure who has his arm outstretched. Beelzebub, which is a, a variation of the term Baal, which was one of the gods that was worshipped on the outskirts of Hebrew culture, who also became associated with the satanic. Uh, Baal was, um, or rather Beelzebub, in, in Milton's Paradise Lost, served as a, a kind of sergeant at arms to the figure of Satan. But this illustration by, by Richard Westall is a really prime example of the heroic Satan that began to be extrapolated from John Milton's work. John Milton's work has many famous lines, including among them, better to 
rule in hell, better to, to, to reign in hell than to serve in heaven, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And one of the fallen angels famously declares in book one of Paradise Lost, hard liberty before the easy yoke, hard liberty before the easy yoke. There was this idea emergent from different artistic interpretations of Milton's work that Satan was a kind of magnificent naysayer, a figure of rebellion, self-assertion, a figure who couldn't be contained within the simple plain hierarchy of heaven, a figure who was considered glorious in his pursuit of his own dominion, a figure who was willing to give up and to sacrifice um, the splendor of heaven in order to rule in his own domain. Hard liberty before the easy yoke. One of my favorite illustrations, in fact, probably my, my most doted upon illustration of the heroic Satan was done by William Blake. It's this watercolor from 1808. Uh, Blake did a series of plates illustrating Paradise Lost. And this one, Satan arousing the rebel angels, is one of Blake's most famous paintings and is probably one of the best known images of the so-called heroic Satan. Blake took matters uh, further with a, a work of his, maybe his most influential work, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, an illustrated work which he published in 1790. Uh, this book, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, saw heaven and hell, God and Satan, as necessary complements to one another, a kind of Western yin and yang. And this work of Blake's, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, included a section which I've pictured here called Proverbs of Hell, Proverbs of Hell which included the same law, for the lion and the ox is tyranny, another way of saying to each his own, which included any food caught by trap or net is unwholesome. The Proverbs of Hell served the idea that humanity needed to strive. It needed to make its own way. It needed to be left to its own devices. That pleasure not pursued, that desire not pursued, that was sin, that was failure that the human spirit would wither if it failed to extend its reach. The human spirit would wither if it failed to assert itself, if it failed to create, if it failed to produce, if it failed to say no to unjust authority. The Marriage of Heaven and Hell was an extremely controversial work which gave rise to a literary and uh, uh, period that is widely known as one of Romantic Satanism. And one of the great exponents of Romantic Satanism was Lord Byron, who's depicted here in a satirical cartoon in the year 1820 of being kind of a servant of Satan. And you'll see that Lord Byron's uh, cloved foot is stepping on a book, which is the Book of Revelation. And you'll see kind of an image of an anchor here. An anchor was considered a symbol of sainthood or martyrdom within Christianity. Now, Lord Byron's sin, and the reason that he was satirized this way, is that in 1821, roughly contemporaneous to this illustration, he wrote a wonderful, wonderful play called Cain, which is little read today. You can find it on the internet. It's very simple, it's very short, it's very beautiful, it's very compelling. Uh, in Lord Byron's Cain, he attempted to tell the story of Cain and Abel from Cain's point of view. And it's fascinating, it had never been attempted before. He attempted to do for Cain what John Milton had done for Satan, which was to sort of look at things from his point of view and ask, well, what is the so-called bad guy thinking? And in this wonderful short play, Lord Byron depicted Abel as a kind of hectoring fundamentalist who was always trying to force his piety upon Cain. And Cain was an inventive, disgruntled rebel who struggled and failed to find his way in life, only to have his pious, blessed brother constantly trying to force his own form of worship onto Cain. And Cain, striking out in a moment of uh, emotional anguish, unintentionally kills his brother, commits an act of fratricide. And Cain, in this play, has a very a detailed dialogue with Satan. And Satan says to him, 
I, I know the thoughts of those who sleep in dust. I am among them, and I know the thoughts of you. And Satan becomes a kind of father figure to Cain. Cain becomes Satan's Faust in a certain sense. And it's sort of an expression of how violence is beget from the human tendency to want to tell other people what to do, a principle that I hold to very, very deeply that Abel's lust, Abel is always depicted in scripture as this pious, blameless being, but Abel's lust in Lord Byron's work is that he desires and cannot live without telling his brother what to do. And that is what begets violence. Yes, the violence is tragic, it's emotional. It scars Cain for the rest of his life, but it grows out of his opposition to being told what to do. Uh, Byron came under a great deal of fire for promulgating this point of view, which you see depicted in this satire. Another figure who was satired as a pawn of Satan was an American uh, figure, Victoria Woodhull, Victoria Woodhull, which some of you have probably heard of. Victoria Woodhull was a famous trance medium who presided over seances, was a medium to the uh, railroad magnate Cornelius Vanderbilt, and she was an advocate of free love, universal suffrage, democratic socialism, and she became the first woman to address a joint session of Congress in the year 1871. She spoke before Congress and delivered a speech on behalf of universal voting rights, which was called the Woodhull Memorial. And if you look up Woodhull Memorial on Google, later, don't do it now, you'll find what stands up today as a very compelling uh, speech on behalf of universal suffrage. At the end of her speech, she was asked by reporters where she got her ideas because they couldn't fathom that a woman could express herself with such power and dignity. And she said, well, it so happens that I have this tunic-wearing spirit guide who appears to me in dreams and has given me all my ideas since I've been a little kid. Uh, the next year, the next year, Woodhull ran for president on the ticket of a party called the Equal Rights Party. I don't think she appeared on a single ballot, but she ran a protest campaign for the presidency. This was an era in which women didn't have the right to vote and wouldn't for another couple of generations, and she was launching this protest campaign uh, with which uh, the satirist uh, Thomas Nast, writing in Harper's Weekly, depicted this cartoon image of her with satanic wings reading, get thee behind me, Mrs. Satan. So that's what Lord Byron and Victoria Woodhull were treated to. Um, the idea of a satanic or Luciferian force as a force of liberation was one that really took on steam in the late 19th century. You'll see this 1894 calendar from Stockholm, Sweden is called Lucifer, a worker's calendar. You'll see Next to it, Lucifer, a journal, which was published in fall of 1887 by Madame H.P. Blavatsky, who I'll be talking a little bit more about later, the great Russian world traveler and controversial occultist. And they probably, the publishers of these journals, and Madame Blavatsky in particular, would have made this distinction to which I referred earlier uh, to uh, the Luciferian and the Satanic. And, and Madame Blavatsky certainly would have said, that such a distinction was relevant, it was necessary, and she saw Lucifer as, as a force of rebellion. Again, I don't personally make that distinction. I think it's more rhetorical than it is absolutely uh, organic, but, but it's important to note that some do, and that, that should be respected. Um, uh, finally, another view of the Satanic, which is less than heroic, uh, was found in Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov, which he published in its final form in the year 1880. And in 1969, there was an extraordinary uh, movie version of the Brothers Karamazov made in the Soviet Union, and it depicted a confrontation between the character Ivan and a figure representing the devil, which may have been real or which may have been a figment, and we're going to take a look at that now. And... <laughs> Может 
Среди группы. Она к столу готова. Ой, вы же поплатила за строительство. А, это было там. Где там? Ну там, у нас. Я торопился на дипломатический прием, как на бывшей Петербургской даже. Так ты думал, ты хочешь себя не платить, но заверить меня, что ты существуешь, а я никогда. Слышишь? Никогда. Не поверь. А то, что он тоже не поверит. Но она критичная, ты, наверное, веришь. Я в той минуты не поверил. Я в той секунды. Напрасно, напрасно. Был у вас на земле уже один такой мыслитель и филолог. Все отвергал. Что законы, совесть, вера. А главное, будущую жизнь. Тоже. Думал, что прямо вам нравится? Нет. Принял будет всю жизнь. И зубился его деграмм. Это противоречит моему убеждению. Это я Это за лицо я сам сочинил, когда я чувствовал гимназию. Поймал, поймал, поймал. Это и я тебя поймал. Я тебе твой же анекдот рассказал, что ты окончательно во мне разумеет. Ушел. Хрень твоего появления уверить меня, что ты есть. Не знаю. Но борьба. Но беспокойство. Но борьба веры и не вере. Это ведь такая мука для стоя всего человека, вот как ты, что лучше повесится. Я тебя вожу между верой и без веры. Попей. Послушай. Вот так ты сам Бога не веришь. Как тебе сказать, если ты серьезно меня? Есть Бог или нет? It's an arresting clip, isn't it? Now, Dostoevsky's interpretation was that Satan, whether real or not, and we're left to wonder in this clip, torments the individual by placing him or her into a constant state of doubt. And it could be looked at in a different way, though. In some regards, a state of doubt is the only state in which we're healthy and powerful and strong. When we get into a state of belief, well, seen from a certain perspective, that's when we're Abel, isn't it? The brother Abel forcing our beliefs onto our brother Cain. That may be where violence comes from. That may be where ultimate friction comes from. Certainty. Certainty. So it could be seen that a state of doubt, a state of uncertainty, is perhaps humanity at its highest. Concurrent with these developments was an occult revival in Europe, which eventually began to spread all around the world. Some of it was attributable to the French esotericist Eliphas Levy, whose book from 1854, The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, not only gave us the initial idea at least in the Western world, of the upside-down pentagram, but he created this image of the sabbatic goat, or Baphomet, Baphomet, a goat-like god, a horned god that was said to be worshipped by the Knights Templar before they were vanquished by the Vatican in the year 1312. And Levy's, Levy's beautiful and magnetic sketch of the sabbatic goat eventually became paired with the term Baphomet, which he also uses in his 1854 book. And this figure became probably the most uh, popular and widespread uh, depiction of the satanic, and it endures as such within the 21st century world. This idea of the upside-down pentagram is a very alluring idea, and I think it was popularized in the fullest sense by a woman I mentioned earlier, and that was Madame H.P. Blavatsky. Madame Blavatsky, shortly before her death in 1891, published her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine, a two-volume encyclopedia occultum in which she ventured all kinds of extraordinary topics and theories about the cosmic genesis and purpose of humanity. And one of the things that she wrote about early in her first volume was the existence, as you can see here on the screen, of the symbol of the Kali Yuga, or the current debased age that we're in, as being a five-pointed star reversed. 
and she made the point that within Vedic culture there were magicians of the left-hand path who practiced a concept of self-affirmation to the exclusion of all other values. So a magician of the left-hand path might say that his or her highest principle is not thy will be done, but my will be done. Thy will be done being deference to God, being a, a right-hand path principle. My will be done being veneration and elevation of self, that being the central principle of the left-hand path. The symbol of which, as Madame Blavatsky brought to Western attention, is this upside down pentagram, which was illustrated for probably the first time in modern Western culture by this magician named Stanislas de Goida in his book, uh, well, it could be called uh, The Book of Black Magic in 1897. Now you'll see here uh, this full, complete illustration as de Goida produced it of the reverse pentagram, the horns up pentagram, and there's Hebrew lettering around it, uh, which if you go counterclockwise reads Leviathan, Leviathan. Leviathan being the serpent that we talked about earlier from scripture. And across the top is the phonetic spelling of Samael, Samael, who's said to be in Judaic folklore, the name of the demon who wrestled with Jacob one night and left Jacob walking with a limp. And then at the bottom, you see a phonetic spelling of Lilith. Lilith, not a figure who appears in scripture, but a female figure who is, again, said within rabbinic writing and Jewish folklore to have been a figure who was created before Eve, or possibly a figure who came along after Eve and who was Adam's a consort. She came to be seen as a kind of uh, female demonic force, as Samael came to be seen as a male demonic force, and both are united around the image of the goat-headed god, or Baphomet, and are anointed with the Hebrew lettering of Leviathan. And it wasn't very long before the upside-down pentagram began to appear in a variety of sources, uh, to the point where we have this image today, not specifically credited to any artist, but kind of an amalgam of some of these images. That's the image today that's used by the Church of Satan and all kinds of heavy metal kids around the world. I probably have a tattoo of this somewhere on me. And, <laughs> and it's an image that's recognizable all over the world. Also uh, roughly contemporaneous with this period of time was the publication of a French book, La Basse, or Down There, by a writer named J.K. Hoismans, who made the case in this novel that there was something called the Black Mass that was getting celebrated in high circles throughout Paris and other portions of France. And you know, one hears a great deal about the black mass in popular culture. There's no exact liturgy or family tree that points to the existence of a black mass. It's one of these things that was referred to and talked about in popular culture, just like the Faust myth was. And eventually certain people like Hoismans began to write it down, began to integrate it into works of art. So it sort of became a kind of fait accompli that the, popular, the public mind, the popular mind, began to believe in the existence of a black mass that was, that was hidden and being practiced out there. And early cinema uh, helped to solidify this idea uh, in the public mind, sometimes in, in some of the most pioneering works to emerge from silent early cinema. And we're gonna take a look at one right now, which is a silent film. This is not scored, this is completely silent. Um, produced in Sweden in 1922 by the really visionary director, Benjamin Christensen, called The Black Mass. And it is just breathtaking, so take a look.
Yeah. <laughs> he stopped at nothing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, it's just extraordinary that in the year 1922, when electrical lines and telephone lines hadn't been extended to many parts of the world, somebody could have created a work like this with this use of light and shadows and costume. You can only imagine how extraordinary this must have felt to somebody a century ago sitting in a dark theater watching this with some sort of a musical score presumably being played in the background and how persuasive and frightening it was. Now, about six years later, there was an anonymous film that emerged from France, also called The Black Mass, that was more erotic in nature, which we are gonna take a look at now. And this a particular clip is scored. It's scored with a modern piece of music, but it's so well suited to the film that uh, we decided to keep it intact, even though it's a modern score. In this film, um, Messe Noir, aka The Black Mass, is a very erotic in nature, and it, it's kind of a, a brilliant hoax, because in a way it purports to be an actual documentation of The Black Mass, but I don't think you'll need too much persuasion that it's uh, a work of imagination. A oh, trigger alert, there's nudity. So Satanism was a little more life-affirming in France than in Sweden, as we can see. And it's obvious from the cardboard cutout brick wall in the background that this was all staged, but people found it very convincing. Um, here is just one of the most extraordinary uh, figures from avant-garde culture uh, of the 1920s, the actress and socialite Louisa Cassati who is pictured here with boa constrictor in Paris in the early 1920s. I tried very hard to get the name of the photographer and exact year of this photograph, but was unable to find it. But I was so struck by how Cassati and her collaborators in the early 1920s captured the whole aesthetic that we would later come to associate with the allure of the evil or the allure of the dark side 
is a better way of putting it. This is the aesthetic that would later be brought to the stage, as we'll see, by heavy metal bands and hard rock acts. This was the aesthetic that, in a more tame way, uh, was brought to Disney films and to cartoons. The whole idea of the dark side being sexy, alluring, erotic, evocative. You know, this woman captured this in the space of a, a single photograph. And here was another great aesthetic figure, the artist and magician Aleister Crowley. This photograph from 1921 is one of the most famous of Crowley's. Crowley was not, strictly speaking, a Satanist. He didn't believe in the existence of an actual uh, devil. Uh, he did believe in the existence of a, a hierarchy of unseen beings, angels, demons, spirits, who could contact you or you could contact, whose forces and influences could be felt on or through you. Uh, there was an unseen figure named Iwas who became his spirit guide uh, and, 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 and through Crowley. Uh, Iwas dictated a channeled work of literature in 1904 in Cairo called The Book of the Law. So Crowley certainly believed in a hierarchy of spirits, angels, demons, but the existence of an actual Satan was not part of his belief system, although he was a great provocateur. So he referred to himself as the great beast or the wickedest man alive, and he loved jousting with the British press. Uh, we could do a whole night on Aleister Crowley on what was beautiful about him, what was ugly about him. There was certainly plenty of both. But uh, what, what must be said is that he was a, a great esthete. He was a great performance artist. He was a being who, like Luisa Cassati, created some of our most lasting images of the occult, of the allure of the dark side. And you'll see on the upper corner right above me this beautiful image of David Bowie echoes an image from 60 years earlier of Aleister Crowley posing in Egyptian regalia. Aleister Crowley appeared on the cover of the Sgt. Pepper's album. Aleister Crowley provided the aesthetic, as Cassati did, for generations and generations of occultists. And I think it's fair to say that our world, our movies, our music, our visual arts wouldn't be the same today were it not for the existence of this man. And here is a prime example. Here is a film that came out of the counterculture, a clip of Kenneth Anger's Lucifer Rising. And this is such a, an evocative, beautiful, 30-minute abstract experimental film of which we're only going to take a look at two small parts. The first part, I want you to look for uh, the following. In the rebirth of Lucifer, as it's depicted in Anger's beautiful film, you will see uh, a kind of unification of all the different uh, pre-Christian uh, faiths, Egyptian, Persian, Celtic. And in the second part, you'll see a sun disk or a sun seed rising uh, in the background of some beautiful Egyptian monoliths. And it gave birth, I think, to some of our ideas today about UFO sightings being messages from extra dimensional beings. I also want to point one thing out before I, I run this clip, which is that uh, I mentioned earlier that the director Ronnie Thomas and I were in Egypt earlier this year where we were shooting footage for a documentary about the occult book, The Kabbalion. And let me tell you, it was tough going uh, getting footage uh, in Egypt uh, today as then is not easy, it's expensive, it's difficult on a whole variety of levels, and it's absolutely extraordinary that Anger got the footage that he did, uh, including right at the base of the Great Sphinx, which is part of what you're going to see. That's Mary Unfaithful.
I have to say in tribute to Kenneth Anger that I think the imagery that he produced in this film is as evocative and as memorable, memorable as anything that Orson Welles brought to the screen. And this film was torn apart by dissension on every side. Uh, Kenneth contracted a musician named Bobby Beausoleil to star in it, parts of it, to do the music. They had a terrible falling out. Bobby later became one of the figures who committed a murder under the auspices of the Manson family. Kenneth also contracted the great guitarist Jimmy Page to construct the score. They couldn't get along and they had a terrible falling out in 1976. It's one of the reasons why there's no one single year that you can really pinpoint as the completion of Lucifer Rising because it kept getting recut and remade because Kenneth kept having angry fallouts with everybody on the film. <laughs> so a final consensual version of it seems to have been released in 1980. Uh, this particular version uh, does apparently have part of Jimmy Page's score, but this was sort of a patchwork of these various torn apart relationships between very difficult uh, and fractious human beings, and yet what emerged from this half hour, I think, is just some of the most memorable uh, images ever committed to film. A uh, contemporaneous with Kenneth Anger was the figure of, get ready everyone, Anton LaVey, whoops, the black pope of the Church of Satan. Um, Anton, who was a jack of all trades, uh, photographer, animal trainer, showman, musician, philosopher, writer, magician, declared that in 1966, God was truly dead, the Christian era was ended, and that it was the year of Satan. And he founded his Church of Satan in San Francisco. He presided over the Church of Satan uh, from his house known as the Black House in San Francisco, struck up friendships with a variety of figures, including Jane Mansfield, with whom he is pictured here in 1967. It's not clear that Anton and Jane Mansfield got together for any more than a kind of a glorified publicity stunt, but it gave an idea of Anton's ability and capacity to find his way into the mainstream public mind. He looked the part of what he was preaching and writing about. He lived the part and he attracted many celebrity followers and friends, at least for fleeting periods of time, including Sammy Davis Jr., who here is pictured between Anton and Michael Aquino, uh, who had been a, a close collaborator of Anton's, who later broke off and founded his own movement, the Temple of Set, which we'll hear more about. There's also a figure of Sammy alone with Michael Aquino. Uh, Sammy wrote in his... Uh, he wrote two autobiographies, both excellent. The first was called Yes, I Can, which came out in 1965. Uh, the second, which came out in the 1980s, called Why Me? He wrote about his flirtation with Satanism and said that he was interested in trying everything. He liked Anton's philosophy, but eventually he drifted away after about 18 months, realizing that it was not for him. Uh, maybe that's because Sammy was at this particular event. He was just an ordinary Thursday afternoon at Anton's house. This is from um, a magazine called Sun Disc, which was kind of a countercultural pornographic magazine. And the figure who is uh, situated next to the black hooded uh, figure on Anton's left, I'll point to her right here. This is rumored to be, rumored to be, uh, Susan Atkins who was also known as Sexy Sadie, who was part of the Manson family. And those of you who have seen Quentin Tarantino's brilliant movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, will know Susan Atkins from her screen depiction as the person who is fried by a flamethrower at the end in <laughs> the hero's swimming pool. Uh, that's rumored to be Susan Atkins. But this is the kind of thing Anton would engage in. I mean, believe me, he was libertine and had plenty of fun, but he also really knew uh, a good celebrity partner, a good photographer, a good uh, photo spread and pictorial uh, when he saw it, and he had almost a limitless ability to court the media. However, however, it would really be insufficient and inaccurate to conclude that Anton LaVey was simply a sensationalist. He was also a real magician and a remarkable thinker, something that was brought to my attention by my dear friend 
Carl Abrahamson, a Swedish writer and filmmaker who is pictured here with Anton in the late 1980s. Uh, Carl refers to himself in these photographs as Satan's little helper. And um, <laughs> Carl, uh, as, in addition to being a, 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 a co-seeker and, and someone with whom um, I've, I've had the, the privilege to collaborate, has been a huge influence on me because uh, about two years ago with Carl's book, A Culture, he really turned my head around about Anton LaVey and made me understand that Anton was not just a media sensationalist or a glorified performance artist, but that Anton really was an intellect and a magician and a philosopher and a thinker. And he was someone who left his mark on the 20th and 21st centuries in ways that are not always fully understood. And Carl helps bring this to light in his forthcoming documentary, Into the Devil's Den, of which we're going to view a part right now. Anton LaVey was many things to many people. Musician, magician, writer, wild animal trainer, police photographer, film buff, founder of a magical group and possibly of a new religion. And yes, he was a Satanist. With his creation of the infamous Church of Satan in 1966 and his best-selling book, The Satanic Bible, in 1969, Anton LaVey changed the ball game in many ways. Here was a free-spirited San Francisco-based group, neither in favor of mind-expanding drugs nor of peace and love for its own sake. Here was a group that was decidedly, outspokenly anti-Christian. Here was a group that brought dark, pro-sexual psychodrama and the philosophy of Nietzsche straight into the American living rooms and TV couches. Anton LaVey became a celebrity scapegoat who basked in the attention and made a successful career out of it. But who was Anton LaVey behind the public persona that so easily provoked primitive American Christians and other intolerance? Who was this enigmatic American Adversary. And I would say that I'm a very happy man, an extremely happy man, in a compulsively unhappy world. And you can actively pick and choose and create your own reality based on the things that, that resonate with you. And LeVay was completely in touch with that, aware of that, and advocated that. The future of Satanism is assured. There's nothing I can say or do that's going to retard it or advance it. He was a man of deep conviction. And through all of his misanthropy, I would have to say he was an idealist, or else he never would have done what he did. He is so difficult to fit <laughs> into the pastiche of occultism in America because he didn't really belong to any clear identifiable intellectual family tree. He created his own family tree, in a sense. He reached backwards to primeval philosophy. He reimagined the idea of the satanic in a way that had historical integrity, but was also new. Now, it is a hallmark of every church and every religious movement that you must have what? A faction split. That's what we do. So Michael Aquino, who you saw pictured earlier with Anton and Sammy Davis, uh, was a close collaborator of Anton's, and he broke off in 1975 and founded his own movement called the Temple of Set. Uh, Aquino, who is still living today, is an absolutely brilliant man. I've never met him. I don't know him. But I admire his intellectual works very much. In the early 1970s, when Aquino was still part of LeVay's Church of Satan, he was also an intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. In fact, he eventually rose to the rank of lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. And he went on a tour of duty to Vietnam with a paperback of John Milton's Paradise Lost. 
and under the conditions of battle in Vietnam and reading Paradise Lost, Aquino created a, a, a new parabolic scripture, which he called the Diabolicon. And in the Diabolicon, this early 1970s work, Aquino basically retold the story of the expulsion from heaven, and he told it from a satanic perspective, uh, somewhat similar to what Lord Byron was doing in retelling Cain's story from Cain's perspective. And in doing so, um, Aquino didn't deny the existence of a Judeo-Christian God, but depicted that God as a being like Zeus and Jupiter, who was imperious, who was all controlling. And the figure of Satan or Lucifer uh, wanted to breathe free and saw humanity as creatures who also deserve to breathe free, not, be, not to be kept like pet poodles in a garden of paradise, but to be given choice, creativity, possibility. And the friction between the two was so great that eventually Satan was expelled from heaven. And you can read about this in Aquino's Diabolicon. And as far as efforts go in the 20th century to craft new scriptures, I have to count Aquino's as one of the finest. He also wrote uh, another short work uh, around this period of time where you see him pictured with his wife Lilith here uh, called The Book of Coming Forth by Night. And in this book he talks about a transmission that he received, you might call it a kind of channel transmission similar to what Aleister Crowley described in his Book of the Law in 1904 in which he came to realize that the Egyptian god Set, who we took a look at earlier, was really the archetype of everything that's referred to as Satan or the Satanic in the Western world. And he came to feel that reviving the cult of Set, reconstructing uh, the religion of Set and veneration of Set was a truer, purer, more intellectually integral form of Satanism or what he would call Setianism. Now, it's difficult to reconstruct the religious movement around Set because even in Egypt today, Set is a god who is little talked about, who is obscure. I mean, you can see these images, which I took myself from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, do not represent Set in the form of these magisterial monolithic statues that you'll see representing Sekhmet or Horus or Bastet or Osiris or Nut or other gods and goddesses of the Egyptian pantheon. Set was an outsider god. Set was the god of the desert, the god of storms. Not exactly the god of the underworld, but he was also, depending on the telling, an uncle to or a brother to the god Horus. And Set was the great opponent, the great adversary. Set was the outsider, the rebel. He was the Cain figure. He was the fallen angel figure who fought with the dominant gods of Egypt, who was vanquished in physical form, but not in spirit. So Aquino felt that um, his temple of Set was a, a truer, uh, more valid antecedent to the figure of Satan in the Western mind than LaVey's uh, Church of Satan. So the temple of Set goes on today. And if you want to read any of, of Aquino's writings, which I encourage, you can go online and you can look up the Diabolicon or the Book of Coming Forth by Night. Uh, Aquino is a great intellect and they're well worth reading. Uh, the Church of Satan marches on today uh, under the tutelage of Peter H. Gilmore, who is pictured here with Anton LaVey in the late 1980s. Uh, Peter is a musician and magician who lives here in the New York area up in the Hudson Valley. Uh, contemporaneous with the doings of Anton LaVey and Michael Aquino was the emergence of what was originally a British group uh, called the Process Church. The Process Church, which is no longer existent, at least in its original form, was an extremely controversial organization that was accused of practicing Satanism, and it was a little more complicated than that. First of all, um, I'm remiss in not pointing out, this is Mary Tyler Moore on a British street in the late 1960s, purchasing some processed church material. And <laughs> I was gonna put a funny caption on this, like, Mr. Grant, I'm a Luciferian now, but <laughs> couldn't get it quite right, but I'll find it. Um, the processed church, uh, again, it's, it's quite controversial. It was uh, founded, co-founded, by a man named Robert de Grimstone, who is pictured here. Uh, 
uh, in a, a British tabloid, was said to worship violence and Satanism and war. And as is always the case with these things, the truth is a great deal more complex and textured. Um, what the Process Church uh, believed in and, and what its theology promulgated was the existence of a four-part God. You'll see the names on the screen here of Lucifer, Jehovah, and Satan. Those are three names, but I said a four-part God. That's because process theology held that you had a lower iteration of Satan, which was associated with violence and animal satisfaction and a kind of unreasoned savagery. You had a higher iteration of Satan, Satan which was associated with a kind of um, radical selfhood, extolling of the self, physical genius, mastery of crafts and engineering. And then in between, in between, you had these figures called Lucifer and Jehovah. Lucifer being the god of the libertine, the artist, the designer, the actor, the thespian, the lover of life, Jehovah being the god of the ascetic, the self-denier, the charity giver, the person who wanted to pursue justice. And so sandwiched in between these lower and higher iterations of Satan were these fairly Judeo-Christian formulations of a life-giving Lucifer and an ascetic Jehovah, and that you had to pass through all of these to finally and fully express yourself. It's important to understand that when the Process Church used the term Satan, they were using it in their very own individualistic way, and I think they would have pointed out that Satan, in their view, was a kind of amalgam of the figures of the great adversary and the peace-giving Christ. They saw all religions as basically true, and humanity uh, stumbling and forgetting itself and falling into a state of confusion because it would deny those parts of religion, specifically the Satanic and the Luciferian, that it could not deal with. But the Process Church was deeply controversial. Some said, uh, some theorized, I think shakily, shakily, that it was an influence on Charles Manson and the Manson family. I don't think that is a correct reading. I do think that it's probably correct that Charles Manson, who was living in Southern California and for a shorter time in Northern California at the same time that the Process Church was experiencing its ascension here in the United States, he certainly came in touch with some of their material. But whether it was anything more than a fleeting uh, source of influence on him, I think, is very debatable. There was a coterie of Process Church people who visited Manson in jail and got him to write an article for them while he was under incarceration for one of their magazines, a magazine that dealt with evil, uh, an issue of one of their magazines that dealt with evil and the dark side. Um, that may have been a a foolishly sensationalistic move that served to forever cement the idea that the Process Church was somehow evil and was associated with, with Manson. But again, I think that association is, is much looser and uh, more imaginary than, than some people hold forth, although I'm not going to defend what I would regard as a feckless and foolish act of sensationalism. The only reason I show this image of John Lennon and Yoko Ono from 1973 is just to point out the folklore that kind of develops around uh, some of these groups and ideas. Uh, I vividly remember overhearing my sister on the phone, my older sister in 1973, talking to one of her girlfriends and theorizing that uh, John Lennon and Ringo Starr had shaved their heads in solidarity with Charles Manson. That was sort of a, a youth rumor that was going around at that time. There was no connection whatsoever. And yet, it is unusual and it is strange how certain people and certain figures within this cultural milieu uh, overlap, sometimes in tragic ways. Uh, this was the case of director 
Roman Polanski, who made the really, truly extraordinary movie, Rosemary's Baby, in 1968. Now consider, Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, as we know, was pregnant, was murdered by members of the Manson family in a brutal, horrific style, along with some of her friends living at the Polanski home while Roman was out of the country. It's so odd, it's so odd how some of these cultural events overlap in ways that can seem almost uncanny. I mentioned earlier that Sammy Davis Jr. was a member of the Church of Satan. There's a scene in Rosemary's Baby where Rosemary, played by Mia Farrow, is very vividly uh, shot in her apartment reading a copy of Sammy's autobiography, Yes I Can, which was published in 1965, years before Sammy became associated uh, with the Church of Satan. And this, this cat-eyed, lizard-like figure of the devil who briefly, briefly appears uh, in Rosemary's Baby uh, has its own mythology. In 1969, Anton LaVey told a reporter from the Wall Street Journal the completely invented story that he played the devil in Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> I love Anton, but he was nowhere near the set of Rosemary's Baby. It was completely invented and made up. But to the reporter, apparently it sounded reasonable enough, so he printed it and it, this claim gets repeated again and again and again to this day. Recently, the Sunday Independent in Great Britain credited Anton with playing the devil in Rosemary's Baby. He was, he was nowhere near the set. Um, but he did regard Rosemary's Baby as the best advertisement ever for the Church of Satan because he felt that uh, Polanski had really captured something and accomplished something by depicting this almost likable coven of Satanists living in Rosemary's building, uh, <laughs> including the wonderful actress Ruth Gordon, uh, who this is probably her most widely remembered role. And one of the things that made Polanski's movie so powerful, one of many, is that this coven was located within the environs of just everyday life. I can't believe there's a single New Yorker who doesn't have a neighbor that, uh, that, that won't remind him or her of Ruth Gordon. And, <laughs> and it, was just, it was just an extraordinary movie that I think will, will, will always have posterity. Another movie from the same period a few years later, of course, was The Exorcist which gave most people their idea of the satanic today. When people talk about possession, demonic possession, they are almost always, in one form or another, referring back to the exorcist. This is the power of entertainment. This is the power of culture. People will talk about ideas of somebody being possessed. The other night I was at this wonderful, wonderful panel discussion on UFOs at the Guggenheim Museum, and as a complete non sequitur, the first person to step up to the microphone and ask a question during the question answer period started saying something about Jeffrey Epstein and demonic possession and so on and so forth. And if you ask people to peel back the onion on where they're getting these ideas, almost always they are a closed circuit loop of cultural and entertainment sources that have been reprocessed and talked about by different people. Uh, believe me, the exorcism right of the Catholic Church, which is real, is written in Latin. Alex Jones hasn't read it, you know, I can assure you. And yet, these things get reprocessed into our culture over and over. It, it demonstrates the great power of entertainment as well as what people wish to believe. But The Exorcist was a remarkable movie on, on many levels. First of all, it, 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 one of its, uh, it, I guess its central hero, uh, pictured here at the top of the screen, walking down this Georgetown staircase, was Father Damien, played by the great actor Jason Miller, who died uh, in Scranton uh, several years ago where he was running the public theater. Wonderful, wonderful actor, wonderful character in the movie. A friend of mine in the Catholic Church told me that after the premiere of The Exorcist in 1973, uh, the church saw a tremendous uh, spike in applications among young men who wanted to enter the priesthood because Father Damien presented this, this masculine, heroic, handsome figure uh, combating the devil, or more specifically, a demon. The demon, the demon who is depicted as possessing Linda Blair in The Exorcist is, is pictured on this uh, statue on the lower part of the slide, which is uh, Pazazu, Pazazu, who was a Mesopotamian god of storms, destruction, not dissimilar in his own way to the figure of Set, 
and you'll see he has his, uh, his right hand uh, extended, whoops, and his, his lower hand uh, downward, somewhat like the magician card in the tarot deck. I don't know if you can see it, but he has a serpent for a penis, and this is the figure who supposedly possessed Linda Blair, who is shown walking backwards down the stairs. I'm a lot more impressed with some of the uh, research and, and historicity uh, that went into The Exorcist than I am with the images of Linda Blair, you know, spewing vomit and, and, and her head revolving around and the other things that, that people frequently show as clips. Those things are horrific enough, but the film had an interesting historicity. Um, this is a little known uh, book by an author who inspired a movie that you may have heard of. Uh, his name is Bruce J. Friedman, still living, wonderful novelist and short story writer and screenwriter, and uh, collected in this book of uh, Friedman's is a story called A Change of Plan, A Change of Plan, which in 1972, thanks to the genius of Elaine May, Neil Simon, Charles Grodin, and other writers and actors, was made into a black romantic comedy called The Heartbreak Kid. Now, why on earth, in a cultural and literary lecture about Satanism, would I be referencing a romantic comedy like The Heartbreak Kid? The reason is because I think it is one of the slyest, cleverest, most wonderful interjections of libertine or satanic philosophy that's ever been seen uh, in a mainstream movie. And I'm going to show you two little clips that give you an idea of what I'm talking about. The first one is just a pure joy. This is a scene in which Charles Grodin is confronting the family of a woman that he's fallen in love with on his honeymoon and telling them that he wants to leave his five-day-old marriage uh, to have Sybil Shepherd's hand in uh, betrothal. And the next scene is between Sybil Shepherd and Charles Grodin. Look very, very carefully at the symbolism. I have to be a new big man. Um, I, uh, I made a big mistake about five days ago in New York. Uh, and when I said big, sir, I mean Radio City Music Hall, big. Um, you may have seen her over the pool. She's a, a nice girl. Um, but just. Uh, not, not, not really my type. Uh, I married her because I, I thought it was the decent thing to do. And I've learned that uh, decency doesn't, doesn't always pay off. <laughs> Look at the horns. Look at the flaming horns. Yeah. Look at the horns. She's dressed in white, he's dressed in red. He put on his overcoat over it, so now he's in black. And this is sort of a, a satanic libertine union. This is one of the images that come from this very, very brilliant, wonderful film. Some of the themes I'm talking about probably come out a little more in Friedman's short story, A Change of Plan, than they do in the rather schnookish uh, display of the main character that Charles Grodin brilliantly depicts. But it's one of my absolute favorite movies. Marching forward into the culture of the 1970s, look who's back, Louisa Cassanti, this time in the form of Alice Cooper. And who are the kids listening to? Who do the kids love? These guys, Knights in the Service of Satan. That was the folklore that went around when I was about 12 years old. Today, if you go online, you'll see that people call them knights in Satan's service. That's wrong. That's wrong. I must tell you. This all <laughs> the, uh, 
these guys came from where I came from. <laughs> this all started in Queens. <laughs> it was Knights in the Service of Satan. Uh, I just saw them on their final tour. It was quite enjoyable, actually. <laughs> and then there was this guy, Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> ah, yes, Ozzy, for whom all this is just decoration. Uh, you'll notice on the, uh, in the background there's an upside-down crucifix on the cover of this rather kind of embarrassing uh, album cover to Diary of a Madman. A great uh, musician who has claimed for himself the title of the Prince of Darkness. But for Ozzy, you know, this stuff is just really decoration. But sometimes you'll find satanic sentiments expressed in places uh, that are not only bereft of, of, of occult decoration, but that don't seem occult or metaphysical at all. Like this song, sung by Johnny Rotten. I am an antichrist. I am an anarchist. S thus was inaugurated the wave known as punk, which colors our culture to this day. Another uh, magnificent musical innovation, as far as I'm concerned, was the advent of the black metal movement coming out of Norway. Now, the black metal movement is very controversial because there were a series of church burnings in Norway and murders and suicides in the 1990s. Uh, that were associated with some people who dwelt within the black metal scene. And there's no denying that that's the case. But it certainly didn't characterize the majority of people who are part of the black metal scene. And my favorite band to emerge from that cultural world is Dark Throne. And I want to play a sample of Dark Throne's music for you because as abrasive as black metal may sound to some ears, the growling lyrics, the fuzzy, intense guitars, the Satan referencing lyrics, the musicianship in many, many cases uh, was really extraordinary. And I think probably the greatest group of musicians uh, to come out of the black metal scene, and they are still recording and still going strong, uh, is the band Dark Throne. This is the cover of their second album, A Blaze in the Northern Sky, and this song, In the Shadow of the Horns, I think just highlights some of their music at its best. So I'm going to play a short clip of it for you. This uh, may or may not be your kind of music, but I have to say something um, in tribute to, to Dark Throne and to, to other black metal bands. You know, we live in a consumer culture today, maybe it's always been the case, that repackages uh, regalia, buttons, t-shirts, decoration from works of art and from sources of art that most people don't participate in. If Guns N' Roses sold as many albums as they do t-shirts, you know, they would be rivaling Michael Jackson. And yet every time I turn around, I see, you know, somebody wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt. Uh, the same is true of The Grateful Dead and so on and so forth. So merchandising can earn more money for a band than its music. 
but most of the bands in the black metal world, and this is certainly true of Dark Throne, they really have an anti-consumerist ethic. And if you go online today and you try to find Dark Throne t-shirts or buttons or what have you, you'll find very, very, very little. You'll search long and hard and you'll come up with almost nothing. And if Dark Throne and other black metal bands felt like it, they could use their design, they could use their aesthetic to sell lots of hoodies and headbands and buttons worn by people who maybe had no attachment whatsoever to the black metal scene, but who thought the aesthetic was kind of badass. But the truth is, um, these guys and, and many bands in the black metal scene, they really do have a kind of anti-consumerist or anti-mass production ethic. Uh, they're very true to their musical principles and they do very, very little licensing. And I, I think that, that really says something in today's world because the temptation to market all kinds of stuff and to earn money is ever present and you could argue that there's nothing necessarily wrong with it but these guys to their own financial deprivation uh, have refused that pattern and practice and they really do stand for something. Another musician I admire is um, uh, Glenn Danzig, uh, one of the co-founders of the Misfits and a hard rock and metal artist in his own right who's very interested in satanic philosophy and the philosophy of Anton LaVey. And of course another musician who's interested in Anton's work is Marilyn Manson who deserves to speak for himself. Well, I'm very much into philosophy. There are a lot of different philosophers that I've read over the years like uh, Nietzsche, uh, Darwin, Freud, uh, Alistair Crowley, and uh, finally Anton LaVey. And uh, fortunately he's you know, still alive, so I got to meet with him and talk about his ideas and things like that. And uh, in America, Satanism is uh, sensationalized and kind of misunderstood, and people associated with worshiping the devil and things like that. But it's really a philosophy about uh, individuality and self-preservation. It's about uh, you know being your own god, and uh, yeah, that's a lot of the things that I agree with. So that's why uh, I became friends with him, but by no means is that uh, you know, the only idea that I associate myself with because I incorporate a lot of different philosophies into what I'm about, including Christianity, you know, there's a lot of uh, valuable lessons to be learned from the Bible, I just feel that the way a lot of people uh, interpret it, particularly in uh, the USA, uh, is very hypocritical, and, and that's why I try to open people's mind to that there is different ways of looking at things rather than what we've been told over the past several hundred years. Now, I love Marilyn, and I stand behind every word that he said, particularly the, the ethic and the sincerity with which it was said. I would add only that one view of Satanism is that it's the elevation of the self, the extolation, the worship of the self. Um, and that is the point of view that holds sway today within the Church of Satan. But I would say that that's not exclusively held to. There certainly are people who consider themselves Satanists who have a metaphysical view of life or a spiritual view of life. And by spiritual, I mean extra physical. And who do believe that there are extra physical energies that our uh, primeval ancestors called by names like Set or more modern names like Satan or Lucifer and that these primordial energies can be appealed to and can be entered into relationship with. So while I celebrate what Marilyn was saying, I think that that's, that's certainly one interpretation of Satanism. There are also metaphysical interpretations. One great artist and magician and disruptor who was involved in this world and continues to be so is uh, Genesis P. Orridge, a great artist, uh, one of the co-founders of the band Psychic TV and Throbbing Gristle, uh, someone who was acquainted with Anton LaVey, who spent some time with Anton, but Jen and her collaborators embarked upon their own just unclassifiable, undefinable experiment, unfolding experiment into magic, which goes on today. Now, Anton LaVey recently returned to us. Uh, some of you may have seen a dramatic depiction of him in the last season of American Horror Story, which I'm going to show you a small clip of here. And then they came. Sunday 
became black as sackcloth and hair, and the whole moon became as blood. And the stars fell from the sky <coughs> to the earth, but the great day of wrath is come. I made the presence of my Lord. Now, um, my friends in the Church of Satan were not amused, shall we say. <laughs> um, they pointed out that this depiction showed Anton quoting from the book of Revelation, almost certainly something Anton would not have done. He didn't see himself as a knockoff of Christianity. Uh, he didn't come to take part in Christianity. He came to sort of take over. You know, he wanted to overturn everything. So he wouldn't have been speaking of himself or seeing himself as some sort of an adjunct to Christian theology. But uh, with all deep respect and love uh, for my friends in the Church of Satan, I, I got a great kick out of that depiction. And I assume that, you know, 30 years on, people are going to get depicted in ways that don't always square to reality. Of course, uh, I, I got very angry with Quentin Tarantino's uh, depiction of the great Bruce Lee in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, wrote a whole article about it, so maybe I'm not really practicing what I'm preaching, but it was interesting to see Anton appear on, on a mass show like that. You know, one of the interesting things that you'll find is that sometimes cinema does a better job of expressing certain philosophies than the, the literature in the field. I had mentioned earlier uh, how much I admired the early writings of Michael Aquino, and I thought they were quite brilliant, and did espouse a real philosophy and ethic and outlook. I feel that's missing from satanic literature today. Frankly, it's something that I'm, I'm trying to attain in some of my own work. I think that the literature has kind of fallen on a pattern of repetition, and it doesn't enunciate a really compelling set of ideas and philosophy. Uh, my friend Michael Muhammad Knight um, converted to Islam at the age of 15 after watching the Spike Lee movie Malcolm X. And Mike asked the question, can cinema be a religious experience? To which I would give a resounding yes. I think cinema can provide ideas that, like The Exorcist, enter into the culture, but that can also be um, formative of a personal philosophy and outlook. If the literature doesn't do it, cinema will. Entertainment can be profoundly uh, evocative and memorable. And I think one of the best pieces of satanic philosophy that I've literally ever heard comes out of the mouth of Al Pacino in a movie called Devil's Advocate, of we will, which we'll watch two clips of. What do you think he's paying us, his ghost blood? Hey, Tarzan. We're billing you out at 400 an hour, my friend. I don't see a whole lot of pro bono work in your immediate future. I think you came down here to make sure I didn't fuck this up. Well, maybe I did. Don't get too cocky, my boy, no matter how good you are. Don't ever let them see you coming. That's the gap, my friend. You got to keep yourself small, innocuous. You're a little guy. You know the nerd, a leper, shit kicking circle. Look at me. Underestimated from day one. You never think I was a master of the universe, now, would you? <laughs> you know I you carried all those bricks for it. God? Is that it? God? Well, I tell you, let me give you a little inside information about God. God likes to watch. He's a prankster. Think about it. He gives man 
inch space. He gives you this extraordinary gift, and then what does he do? I swear, for his own amusement, his own private cosmic gag reel, he sets the rules in opposition. It's the goof of all time. Look, but don't touch. Touch, but don't taste. Taste, don't swallow. <laughs> and while you're jumping from one foot to the next, what is he doing? He's laughing his sick fucking ass off. He's a tight ass. He's a sadist. He's an absentee landlord. Worship that? Never. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, is that it? Why not? I'm here on the ground with my nose in it since the whole thing began. I've nurtured every sensation man has been inspired to have. I cared about what he wanted, and I never judged him. Why? Because I never rejected him. In spite of all his imperfections, I'm a fan of man. I'm a humanist. <laughs> <laughs> now, how's that for theology? <laughs> Roman Polanski returns to the screen with satanic themes in 1999 with his movie The Ninth Gate, which I think is an underestimated movie. People feel it's incomplete. Uh, people feel it has a truncated vision. I love the movie, and I think it's been, I think it's been underestimated. It was based on uh, a 1993 novel called The Club du Mas, which I quoted from on my opening slide. And, you know, I referenced earlier to how there are these, all these wonderful cultural overlaps. If you took a look at that scene in Chinatown from Devil's Advocate, you may have noticed that the camera lingered for an unusual amount of time on the back of somebody wearing a ranger's jacket. You all notice that? The ranger's jacket? Well, it so happens that the filmmaker Kenneth Anger, who made Lucifer Rising, walks around in a ranger's jersey and he tears off the R and the S so that it says Anger. I think that was a tribute to Kenneth Anger. And here in this uh, clip from The Ninth Gate, you'll see uh, Satan's emissary reading a very popular self-help book, which is one of my favorites. Of course, you notice that was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Carnegie does not appear, I can assure you, in the original novel, The Club du Mas, but uh, Polanski, who was one of the screenwriters, dropped that into the film. And it's interesting to ask why. Now again, these worlds overlap in strange ways. I don't think Polanski would have had any way of knowing this at the time, but several years after this film, there was a biography published of Charles Manson in which it was revealed that when Manson was in reformatory school or boys prison when he was an adolescent, one of his favorite books was How to Win Friends and Influence People. So it's very strange that it makes this alluring appearance in The Ninth Gate, just as Sammy Davis Jr.'s uh, biography, Yes I Can, did in Rosemary's Baby. Uh, today, in today's culture, we can't get enough of the heroic Satan, can we? Um, here's Tom Hiddleston being directed by the great Kenneth Branagh in the 2011 uh, movie Thor. And uh, here's Angelina Jolie in her latest role, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. This movie premiered yesterday. I have not seen it. But boy, oh boy, just take a look at the horns. Take a look at the, the, the expression of, of divine, attractive maleficence, self-assertion, rebellion, usurpation. These are figures drawn right out of the leaf of the artists who created the images that I was showing earlier of the heroic Satan. It's taken over our culture. And I think it probably calls to some 
some side deep within us that feels we're not acting when we should be acting. We're passive when we should be active. We are baleful and retreating when we should be creating, when we should be seeking, when we should be generating, when we should be rebelling against unjust authority. Seen in a certain light, the heroic Satan is the lord of legitimate rebellion. And I think this calls to something very deep in us. This calls to why humanity has worshipped the idea of the Promethean from time immemorial. This is a painting by my good friend Tim Bota of Neville Goddard, the great metaphysical teacher who died in 1972 as Prometheus, stealing fire from the heavens. I also think it's important to understand that when the term Satanism is used in this literary, cultural, spiritual, ethical sense, it doesn't mean, at least not in my reading and in my interpretation, that you're existing only for self. I believe that there is a reciprocity, a sense of solidarity, a sense of loyalty that can be found within the satanic ethics and cultural archetypes that we've been reviewing. I write about this in one of many articles uh, at Medium and other places called Satan's Honor Roll in which I distill ideas that I think are authentically ethical, that square with some of these cultural models that we've been observing. Now, of course, I'm not here to make some sort of a religious statement. I'm not here to proselytize. This is a cultural, literary seminar. I would never sully our good work here tonight by making some sort of a propagation appeal. <laughs> <laughs> but I did promise you surprises, didn't I? Those of you who follow me on social media know I never lie. So if I promised you surprises, surprises you shall get. <laughs> Maybe some of you, purely as a personal intellectual experiment, again, there's no propagation here. Maybe some of you, purely as a personal intellectual experiment, would like to examine the metaphysical question of whether there is an opposing force, an adversarial force, a rebellious force that can be appealed to, that can be entered into relationship with. Now, I spoke of the story of Faust and the idea of making a pact with Satan. Where is that idea from? Yes, it exists in folklore. Yes, it exists in Goethe. Yes, it exists in Marlowe. But where did it really come from? Well, some feel that it has its uh, origins in the book of Isaiah 28:15. This is a sturdy enough translation. So, if you feel like experimenting as Faust experimented, there's no return policy on any of this. The goods aren't guaranteed, but you're certainly welcome to try a personal experiment and see what happens. So, if you want to, you can take out your phone you can photograph this screen, or if you can't find your phone or you're too embarrassed to, you can email me <laughs> and I'll send this to you. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we have an agreement. Well, I do believe in a little hands-on philosophy. So if anybody's interested in exploring a pact, there you have it. And we come to the end of our exploration of the counter tradition of Satanism. I thank you all for sitting through this, this demonstration. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been evocative and educative. And we'll now have time, a short time, I'm afraid, for some questions and exchange. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have just 13 minutes, which I think is very appropriate, actually. So. I'll ask for some really heartfelt questions. Uh, I'll repeat them into the mic so the folks who are watching later on video can hear them. And we will have to skedaddle at 9.30 because there's another group coming in here. So anybody, anything on your mind? I'll try to see you if I can. No, you're all good? As Neville said, let's make a good full evening of it. We have 10 minutes. Come on now. Thoughts, questions? No? Oh, yes. Have you uh, entered into a pact? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, I do believe in uh, a metaphysical approach to life. I do believe in a spiritual approach to life. I'm speaking personally, of course. Um, when I say spiritual, I mean a search for the extra physical. And it's my personal conviction. I don't ask anyone else to share it, but it's my personal conviction that our ancient ancestors were onto something when they identified energies and forces in nature, broadly defined, uh, with names like Minerva, or Zeus, or Set, or Yahweh, or Satan. And I think that these forces are things that they had a deeper and greater understanding of uh, than we perhaps do in our mechanized, digitized world uh, today. And I do believe very, very deeply in consensual, personal experimentation. And I believe, look, you know, we're here in these physical forms for a very short time. Now, the materialists may be correct. You know, maybe we really just are moist robots and when these physical forms go away, everything goes away. Although, I simply can't fathom that's true because we have laboratory evidence of anomalous transfers of communication, of extra physical gleaning of information, of thoughts reshaping neural pathways in the brain. We have too much to suggest that humanity does participate in an extra physical existence, I think, to deny that facet of life. I think materialism simply doesn't cover all the bases. And in the same way that we experiment within the materialist world, I believe we should experiment within the spiritual world. And that's been my approach. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? Could you please get into some uh, details on how your uh, relationship with uh, Satan goes? Well, I think it's very personal. You know, one of the things that Michael Aquino wrote that I was very touched by this appears in his short work, The Book of Coming Forth by Night, which I suggest reading. Um, in this work, he documents receiving some sort of a extra physical communication, similar to what Aleister Crowley recorded in the Book of the Law. And in this extra physical communication, the figure known as Set plainly says to Aquino, uh, you should uh, pray to me at night. Uh, pray to me at a time when darkness allows you to see the stars and see the cosmos and speak to me as a friend, not as some lord and master, but just friend to friend in an almost casual way. And I was rather touched by that and I thought if the individual feels like experimenting with that, then he or she should do so. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You, Woven uh, a sort of story in which both pop culture and the arcane uh, tells the same story. And yeah. That, uh, but as a but you also talked about your youth in Queens. What was the uh, the sign that you came across that tipped your scales? Was it pop cultural or was it a book? What was, was there a gateway drug? If you the gateway drug for me was the work of Carl Abrahamson, specifically Carl's book, A Culture, which came out a couple of years ago. Uh, the publisher of A Culture, Inner Traditions, which has also published me, sent me a copy of Carl's book and asked me if I would consider giving it an endorsement. And I said, yes, I would, as you know, people do these things. And when the book uh, reached me in galley form, I had not heard of Carl. I didn't know anything about his work. And I saw that in the book, he had a chapter on Anton LaVey. And it was an intellectual appreciation and re-estimation of Anton LaVey. And it was the strangest thing because I don't know if you've ever had this feeling, but I get this feeling a fair amount. Sometimes I'll encounter a piece of writing or a piece of art or a movie. And I'll know almost instinctively that as I turn the knob of this doorway, I am really about to enter something that's going to have a tremendous personal impact on me and nothing is going to be the same after I turn that knob and enter that doorway. I, I felt that about Carl's chapter and truthfully I didn't have much respect for Anton LaVey prior to that time. If you take a look at my book Occult America, 
I don't think I even mentioned Anton's name in the book, which was a real oversight on my part and something that I hope to ameliorate in a future edition, because at the time I was writing it, I felt that Anton was a showman, a sensationalist, a media hound, not somebody who was a serious occult philosopher or magician. And I was very capable of defending that point of view. But when I read Carl's chapter, I realized that I was wrong. And it, it, it also was concurrent with another realization on my part. And what I'm about to say is very controversial, but I don't mean it to sound provocative or controversial. It's just the truth of my search. Contemporaneous with discovering Carl's chapter, I felt very dissatisfied with my own spiritual search. And I came to a conclusion, which I write about in the introduction to a book called The Black Arts by Richard Cavendish. I came to a conclusion that what I was really searching for within the spiritual world, and what I think everybody is really searching for, whatever they call themselves, is power is a sense of personal power, personal agency. Not the kind of power that entails telling other people what to do or being the boss man or pushing other people around, but the power that allows a person to see through his or her plans in the world. A power that allows a person to act successfully to some greater or lesser degree upon his or her most deeply felt wishes. A power that doesn't exclude the ethic of reciprocity. I don't believe in a go-it-alone approach to life. I believe in loyalty and solidarity and some version of cosmic reciprocity or karma, which I write about in that article, Satan's Honor Rule. But I felt very strongly that when we pray, thy will be done, what we really mean is my will be done. I hope the divine will agrees with my own, or I hope I can find a way to bring myself into a comport with the divine will. And I think you see this wish fitfully expressed throughout many different religious traditions. I also think to the contemporary Western person in the 21st century, I personally do not believe that a path of non-attachment or a path of non-identification is effectively attainable. And I say that as somebody who has traveled through many different religious precincts and who at, at age 53 has been embarked on a search for some time. And it's my conviction, based on many, many different experiences and weighing of ethical and spiritual and psychological philosophies, that when the Western seeker attempts a path of non-identification or non-attachment, he or she is going to be torn into. I think that we are creative beings, we are generative beings, we are productive beings. The artist rightly wants an audience the activist rightly wants a constituency. Uh, the musician rightly wants his or her work to be heard and seen. Uh, the person involved in business, finance, commerce wants their product to move. I think that it is essential to human existence and in fact sacred to human existence that we be productive and that we be generative. And I think in my heart of hearts that that is what we're ultimately looking for when we embark on the spiritual search, which is, which is power. And it's difficult to make that admission because it's so prone to misunderstanding. But I came to that place with very deep and serious consideration. And I suppose I encountered Carl's book, A Culture, uh, at the same time. And I came to a new estimation of Anton's philosophy. And it spoke to me personally because although the Church of Satan today, of which I am not a member, the Church of Satan today uh, speaks in terms of extolling the self. There was room for the metaphysical within Anton's philosophy. And I felt it was an amalgam of certain ideas that I believed in, along with a, a magical and spiritual philosophy that I believed in. So it spoke to me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, hey. You, hey, thank you. Uh, you see Satan emerging in pop culture more today as, as say almost as a call for uh, a longing or, or yeah. more, uh, how do you, uh, what traits rather would you say are more positive for people to look to or to exhibit uh, and why is it that people who seem to question seem to end up in more fascist spaces? 
Oh, that's interesting. Well, the whole fascist aesthetic is a tough question. You know, Anton LaVey wrote a great deal about that. <sighs> Boy, it's a tough question you're asking, and it's a worthy one. The fascist aesthetic is, uh, it's, it can be very powerful. It can be very, very powerful. And it is very interesting how, you know, you ask any Star Wars fan who their favorite character is, and invariably, it ain't Yoda. You know, it's Darth <laughs> Vader. And I think there is something in the human psyche that responds to assertion, um, strength, power, sometimes, you know, quite frankly, even a warrior-like stance. I mean, look, you know, look at our video games, look at our, look at our movie heroes, uh, look at whatever movie is coming out next week. You know, the great likelihood is that it has something to do with some kind of killing or war as entertainment. And there is something in the human psyche which responds to that. There's also something in the human psyche that I think does respond to the rebel, to the outsider. You know, you would see that in Marlon Brando. You would see that in a young Elvis Presley. You certainly see that in hip hop. You saw that in the Black Panthers. You know, you see it in different expressions of, of radicalism and culture over and over again. Sometimes you do see that in an expression of a fascist aesthetic, you know, that, that is there. And I think we have to be intelligent and watchful about that. Um, in terms of our movies, you know, when I saw a poster for Angelina Jolie in this second part of Maleficent, I thought to myself, look at this, mistress of evil, you know, she's wearing a, a, a cloak uh, and a hood with these great ram's horns emergent from it, and this is a Disney movie. And I'm sure when I get around to seeing it, it just opened yesterday, so I haven't seen it yet, but I'm fairly confident that when I get around to seeing it, she will be depicted as some sort of a tragic figure of evil, and somebody was mean to her when she was a kid, so to get revenge, you know, she becomes basically Satan. But isn't it the story? Isn't it the story that, that we've been viewing? And it seems to be some unacknowledged need within our psyche. Yeah. Did you have your hand up? No? Yes, um, we'll take one more because we have to skedaddle. Yes. Um, looking throughout the history of all these depictions of a similar figure. Yeah. And up to today, um, and from what you're, what I understand you're saying, it's all about kind of a counterculture and questioning authority. But there's also this constant undercurrent of sexism throughout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of these depictions of the devil and Satan, what would you say to people who don't identify as men who want to embrace this philosophy but feel kind of one of the outsiders? Oh, yeah. Outside. Bravo, bravo, bravo. First of all, I would say the hero of Genesis 3 is Eve. The hero of Genesis 3 is Eve. She is a female Prometheus. You know, the serpent comes to her says, you must bite this apple, you won't die, you'll be given awareness. She bites the apple, she shares the apple with, with Adam. She gives birth to Cain and Abel, and Cain slays Abel. They have another son later called Seth, who also has some strange associations, but in essence, aren't we all you know, Eve's offspring? Aren't we all Eve's offspring? So I would say, first and foremost, Eve is the Western Prometheus. You know, she's the Promethean figure of Genesis 3. And then you have figures like Victoria Woodhull, the protest presidential candidate from 1872, who's being lambasted as Mrs. Satan. You have Madam H.P. Blavatsky, who, who brought into the Western world awareness of the inverted pentagram and who started a magazine called Lucifer. So to a very great extent, there were many political radicals and proto-feminists in the 19th century who saw the Satanic and the Luciferian as a model of emancipation. And there's a really wonderful, wonderful book that I want to recommend to you and everybody in this room. It's called Satanic Feminism uh, by a writer named Pierre Flexneld. Pierre Flexneld, Satanic Feminism. And it is just an extraordinary portrait of all the different liberatory figures, many of them women, who saw Satan as a kind of liberation figure. And it does such a wonderful job of not only shining this countercultural light onto the women's liberation movement in the modern world, but also tells the whole story of this 
uh, of Satan as a kind of anti-hero, as I've been trying to capture tonight. So thank you. And now we're going to wrap up. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.